Magneto-hydrodynamic thrust has been explained many times, but to understand efficiency, it helps to take a closer look at what is really going on. Looking at a section through a ducted drive, a magnetic field can be created by taking a pair of magnets, placing them on either side of the duct with opposite polarities facing each other. Electrodes are spaced at 90 degrees to the magnets, such that if a voltage is applied to these, a current will flow perpendicular to the magnetic field. The result is a force exerted on the current carrying conductor. In this case it is seawater and the force will be perpendicular to both the current and the magnetic field. Now let's split this thruster down its length and take a look from the side. This force is known as a body force and it is distributed evenly throughout the water. If the cross section of the duct remains constant, then the conservation of mass requires that the mass flow and hence the velocity needs to be constant throughout the duct. Newton's second law requires that if a body force exists on the water, it should be accelerating, and yet we've just shown that the velocity is constant. There must therefore exist an equal and opposite force, such that the total net force on the body of water is equal to zero. Note that this has got nothing to do with Newton's third law. This is Newton's second law, and that opposite force exists in the form of a pressure gradient that ramps up towards the rear of the tube. The reaction force that must exist according to Newton's third law is a body force that is exerted on the magnet. This is due to magnetic field generated by the current through the water. And this force on the magnet is the actual force experienced by the boat as thrust. Momentum theory is a simplified version of explaining the thrust and efficiency of a propeller, where the propeller is modeled as a thin disk with a pressure gradient across it and constant velocity through it. The thickness of the disk is immaterial, and I can just as well stretch it out into a long thin tube. I have also just shown that there is a pressure increase from the front to the rear of the tube, and that the velocity through the tube is constant, so I can now use momentum theory to analyze the thruster's efficiency. It is beyond the scope of this video to show how all the equations are derived, but basically Ahead of the duct the pressure is lower than far upstream and behind the duct the pressure is higher than far downstream. And if you apply Bernoulli separately ahead and behind the duct you'll show that the velocity increases as it is sucked into the front. The velocity then remains the same throughout the duct and then at the back of the duct it again accelerates away until the pressure has fallen back down to the downstream pressure. I'm going to focus on three specific parameters, the boat speed, the speed inside the ducts, and the duct cross-sectional area, and how these three parameters relate to efficiency and the production of thrust. Propulsive efficiency is simply the boat speed divided by the speed inside the duct. This is the maximum theoretical efficiency, and in real life you still have to account for additional losses, such as the skin friction inside the duct. The thrust equation is not that intuitive and it's easier to visualize it as a graph where thrust is plotted against the volumetric flow through the duct. In other words, the velocity through the duct multiplied by its cross-sectional area. From the efficiency equation, it is clear that for high efficiency, the duct velocity should be kept to a minimum. And this of course will require a larger duct cross-sectional area. If the width and height of a square duct are both doubled, then the internal surface area exposed to friction will also double. That is, of course, if the length is kept the same. The cross-sectional area, however, will quadruple, and the required duct velocity will be a quarter of what it was before. The equation for the skin friction includes both the velocity through the duct as well as the wetted surface inside. But note that the duct velocity is squared. If the equation is repeated for the adjusted velocities and areas of the larger duct, it will show that the skin friction has reduced to one-eighth of what it was before. A large duct still has external surface area that will create additional friction. So rather than making a large duct, I decided to do away with the ducts altogether. I placed the magnets inside the hull with their magnetic fields oriented vertically and opposite to each other. From my investigation using the iron filings, 
I notice that the magnetic field has distinct areas where the flux lines run parallel to the surface. This is where I mounted the electrodes flush to the surface. I mounted a positive aluminium electrode between the magnets and two copper negative electrodes on the outside of the pair of magnets. The reason for using dissimilar metals was to exploit the fact that they have different electric potentials in an electrolyte. This provided roughly an additional 0.6 volt on top of what the battery provided. The magnetic field and electric currents are now completely unconstrained and can intersect and crisscross the entire body of water all around the hull. Current leaving the positive electrode now flows outwards across the face of the magnet towards the negative electrode and by crossing the magnetic field it produces a body force on the water exactly as it would do inside the duct. There are however major drawbacks to this design. The magnetic field is not as strong as it would be inside a duct with the magnets facing each other and the magnetic field strength also diminishes very quickly further away from the magnet. The angle at which the electric current crosses the magnetic field is also not always exactly at the optimum 90 degrees. Most of the current flows between the electrodes very close to the hull surface. This is also where the magnetic field is very strong. So the actual velocity of the water is still pretty high and is still creating quite a bit of skin friction. So whether this design is indeed more efficient than a thin duct is uncertain. Even in the case of ducted flows, there are trade-offs between small ducts and large ducts. Magnets that are spaced closer together will produce much stronger magnetic fields. And electrodes that are closer together will have less water and hence less resistance as it travels through the water. But even that assumption is subject to other geometrical variables, such as the length of the duct. For instance, in this example, if the two ducts have the same length, then the total resistance will be the same. The longer distance between the two electrodes is compensated for by the extra height on the electrodes. The higher momentum transfer efficiency of the large duct, unfortunately, does not make up for the loss of thrust due to the weak magnetic field. Another approach is to take a long thin duct and simply chop it up into shorter sections that are stacked in parallel to each other. The magnetic field strength and electrical resistance within each section remains exactly the same. But since the total cross-sectional area of the duct is now four times as large, the inlet velocity will be four times less. In a sense, this is exactly the way the thrusters were designed for the Yamato 1 MHD ship. Each thruster consisted of a ring of six 3 meter long tubes. The electrodes were arranged such that the current flowed radially. Each tube was fitted with a pair of superconducting coils. Together these coils formed a circular magnetic field through all six tubes. A similar arrangement can be achieved with permanent magnets. By arranging them in a star shape, their fields will form a continuous ring through each magnet. Radial electric current can be generated by using two concentric ring electrodes. The challenge in designing a good thruster lies in the trade-off between momentum transfer efficiency and electrical efficiency. Electrical efficiency depends very much on the strength of the magnetic field. Even with a magnetic field of 4 Tesla, the Yamato still had to sacrifice momentum transfer efficiency for electrical efficiency. The electrical losses are still the limiting factor until much stronger magnetic fields can be generated.